やめろ<sighs> well, that's going to take some explaining. So, with the announcement of the Golden Wind anime adaptation, now's about the time to cover JoJo's bizarre adventure, Phantom Blood. Yes, I am aware there is a Golden Wind game. I haven't played it. I have few doubts it's better than this one. And funnily enough, it predates this Phantom Blood adaptation by four years. We may come to the Golden Wind game someday. There is a fan translation project ongoing. Here's hoping they don't get noticed by anyone too big. This taste. It's that of a liar. Jean Giovanna! As you can guess, both of these never came to the West. In the case of Phantom Blood, we weren't really missing much. It's a 3D beat em up, and may not only be one of the worst I've played, but one of the worst I've played that I walked away from with a begrudging respect. There are a small handful of reasons for why this is, and they'll become apparent the further in we get. Now, this video is meant both for people into the series and total newcomers, and I'm sure if you could speak Japanese, the same is true for the game itself. Fortunately for everyone, this game is interesting even without some of the JoJo flavor. For those who are new, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure was a shonen, now seinen manga, that's been ongoing since 1987. It's known for its gorgeous artwork, campy melodramatics, and bizarre puzzle battles loaded with creative use of gimmicky supernatural powers. While later parts focus on spiritual entities called stands, parts 1 and 2 focus on the art of breathing to punch sunlight and escape writing oneself into a corner. There are eight parts, each of them following a different member of the JoJo bloodline in a different time and place. Part 1, Phantom Blood, kicks the series off with Jonathan Joestar, a Liverpudlian noble child in the late 1800s. Jonathan is an idiot, and spends his life yearning to be a chivalrous, quintessential British gentleman. This life of vague want is disturbed when his father George Joestar brings in the orphan Dio Brando, who's a bit of a wrong'un. The story begins with an Aztec tribe performing a sacrifice. The blood is smeared on a stone mask, causing spikes to jut out and clamp into the back of the chief's head, granting him immortality. We then cut to Victorian England. The chief never comes up again, so I can only assume immortality didn't quite pan out. We're in the home of Dario Brando, and he's on his deathbed. He reveals to his son Dio that some time ago he was out robbing corpses, when one of them happened to awake, and mistake Dario for a good Samaritan. Now, 12 years later, with an imagined debt George Joestar has to Dario, Dio is told to head to the Joestar Manor and be taken in. Later, over Dario's grave, Dio vows to become rich and powerful as Dario wanted, but reveals he was poisoning him, revenge for abusing his mother, and generally being a bit of a shit. It's then that we cut to the first villains of the piece, Brat A and Brat B. They're harassing Arena Pendleton, and before they can become fetish trailblazers, Jonathan Joestar jumps to Erina's defense, declaring himself a gentleman as he charges in, and thus begins our first fight. I want to bring to everyone's attention that Jonathan is meant to not only be 12, but a weakling. Don't let his figure fool you, these are both facts. Phantom Blood's combat is at once incredibly sluggish, but also far too fast paced for its own good. Jonathan turns on a dime but the camera can't keep pace, it's downright lethargic, and makes it hard to even keep an eye on one attacker. Adding on to this, there is no lock on, either hard or soft lock, and this game really needs it. It became vital in several fights to use block, not to actually defend myself, but to shimmy Jonathan awkwardly into position, since otherwise he's a lead figure skater. And even that metaphor is off base, since they would have inertia. Right now we have three attacks. A light combo, a heavy push, and a running strike. The latter two are used to open up opponents, but are rarely better than just keeping up punching. They'll block and dodge as they wish. When you dare to launch an attack, or worse, start a combo, Jonathan can no longer turn, and with no soft lock to direct attacks, it can actually be difficult to even aim attacks at opponents. On top of this, Jonathan dedicates heavily to his hits. Besides this, you do have the aforementioned block and a dodge. The block, as I said, is mostly useful for repositioning. Both of these do more or less just work fine. A ton of iframes on a dodge, so exploit it. And this is handy, since enemies have a ton of health, and they do a fair bit more damage than you. There is also no way of hitting downed enemies, and every single combo in the game has an attack with knockdown in it. Plus, there is a 2-bar health system, with red health that can slowly be replenished. 
This all leads to a game that has a fast yet trundling tank of a man with slow heavy attacks that rewards keeping up pressure, then makes it so that keeping up any form of pressure is frustrating and tricksy since enemies are knocked down, away, and out of your range constantly, meaning you regularly have to finagle everything back into place. Those who have read the manga will know that this is a fight Jonathan loses, and it wants you to follow script. And in my first attempt with the sheer shock of these controls, you best believe I got bullied. Should you pull through and win, however, the cutscene changes so that for a moment Jonathan revels in his victory. Then the brats realize who he is and beat the shit out of him anyway. I dislike Jonathan, so personally, I'm fine with this Morton's fork. Dio makes his arrival at the manor in style and kicks Jonathan's dog. So one absolutely beautiful thing about Phantom Blood is how unashamed it is in making Dio unlikable. After a somewhat sympathetic background, he dives headfirst into being the world's biggest shit. The very second he sees Jonathan, he considers focusing his life around how much he can make this man miserable. And he made the decision to go ahead with it before he even hit the ground. Looking at Danny, however, yeah, I can't blame him for feeling threatened. We cut to some time later and Jonathan is out boxing. Clearly after the brat incident, he figured he needed to get bigger. Dio turns up and squares off against our pugilist hero. So, fight number two, and Jonathan has a completely new moveset. He dodges differently, punches differently, all with the exact same basic control issues, mind, except the dodge is worse. So, first point of begrudging respect. There are 15 different variations of Jonathan, with four or five different movesets in total between them. There are nine iterations of Dio, and the entire stable of characters seen in story mode is fully playable. Even those brats at the beginning, even the Chief. So it has a lot of characters, but I have to pull this back by saying there is no free battle option. No way to take the Kenshiro style adult Jonathan and go to town on those brats. There's unlockable bonus battles, but those are preset. I'm going to qualify. Every point of begrudging respect is not me saying they've made a good decision or that this is a good part of a bad game. It's me saying, you had to have known this was a stupid idea but you did it anyway. I'm impressed and confused. I respect people who think like that, who, you know, see a wall up ahead and think the best way through is with their skull. Once again, if you know your Jojo, you know this is another fight Jonathan loses. I'm willing to bet it's sheer luck to actually come out on top of this. Dio is a dodgy one, and in this case, it is literal. I went down for the count on every attempt I made at this fight, but I do know that should you win, the cutscene changes to Dio claiming Jonathan had a rock in his glove and the audience buys it, so Jonathan loses face either way. But he has started going out with Erina, and naturally Dio's on the scene. He steals a kiss from her, and her disgust sets Dio off. This leads to her cutting ties with Jonathan, leading to a bit of a sibling spat. And finally, more than half an hour after hitting start begins the first fight you actually need to win. <laughs> In the interim, Jonathan has combined his 12-year-old wimp style with his later, also 12-year-old, pitiful pugilism. It coalesces into a style that is just as bad. But thankfully, age must be getting to Dio, since he's slowed down in his dotage. It's also now that I have to be capable of winning that I learn my first real lesson about Phantom Blood. Fighting smart does not work. Be aggressive, and as much as the game will allow, never let up. This is partly because enemies will just block and dodge as they wish, and you can't really plan around pure chance. But it's also now that we're given a time limit, 300 seconds. Now, five minutes may seem like a good amount of time, but I assure you, it may not be enough. Especially if you're of the wrong mindset of looking for openings and playing cautious. No, no, get in there, make that opening. <laughs> I've got to give the game another bit of begrudging respect here. There are a lot of minor scenes and nuances gone, but besides that, this is a staggeringly faithful adaptation, to the point that it's willing to be worse as a video game for it, and make you sit down and wait half an hour before you actually need to do anything. It opens with two fights you canonically have to lose, and it spits in your face if you don't. 
Then add on to the fact that you will spend a majority of your playtime listening to narrated manga panels. Since the gameplay outside of the main story is limited, this is most of the experience. This may be the worst way to experience the story of Phantom Blood. This does predate the anime adaptation, so this is for people who want Jojo, who have to simultaneously be too lazy to read, yet patient enough for this really shoddy fighting. Okay, one major event is glossed over. This game never brings up that Dio put Danny in a furnace. Nevertheless, Jonathan is giving Dio a piece of his mind. And that makes the mask react. It shunts off the wall. And I suppose it's at this moment Jonathan decided to become an archaeologist. Dio noticed it as well, but he already had a life plan. Since poisoning worked out last time, Dio's repeating it with George. But this time, Jonathan stumbles upon the plot and gets involved. It's the exact same fight, only upstairs, and about eight years later. Fortunately, it is useful for confirming my non-stop attack strategy. It holds up so far. After some attempted adopted fratricide, Jonathan sets off for London to track down the source of the poison and return with evidence. This brings him to Ogre Street, and to a much-loved character. Jonathan is accosted by Robert E.O. Speedwagon and two of his cronies. And as you would guess, thugs do not fight fair. This is a three-on-one battle. It's the worst fight yet. Your capabilities are not up to snuff for one enemy. Here, take on a gang, each of them just as hardy as Dio. Speedwagon's actually tougher, and he's got a special hat. Fortunately, the AI swings between aggressive and passive pretty regularly, so most of this fight does have to abandon endless attack strategies for trying to trick them into a bunch of one-on-ones in between massive bouts of running away. And that's a habit Jonathan's grandson will get some mileage out of. It doesn't much suit Jonathan, who then refuses to kill a mugger. And Speedwagon, likely off his tits with opium, is so impressed by this act of mercy he immediately devotes his life to following Jonathan around as his unofficial fight promoter. Elsewhere in the city, Dio is feeling down, worried that he's been caught, when he bumps into a couple of thugs of his own. They get far less mercy. And behold, the mask creates vampires. Sometime later, Dio arrives back at the Joestar Manor where he's confronted by Jonathan and told he's going to be taken in by the police. What follows is Dio pulling a sob story where he blames his actions on growing up poor and he just needs more time. Jonathan nearly lets him off the hook, but Speedwagon came prepared. He brought Dio's drug dealer, the police, and George to this mock trial. I guess I should bring up at this point that Dio went to university to become a lawyer. That trait of his doesn't often come up, it's rare he gets to flex his legal muscles. There's a part of me that feels Jonathan and Dio got their degrees mixed up, thematically at least. Dio's no archaeologist, but his study of the mask was by far and away more practical than Jonathan's. Dio surrenders and requests Jonathan cuffs him. As he does, he blames his failings on his humanity, not his getting caught. And cuffing him was just a gambit to get Jonathan in range. I love this panel. Jonathan is so dense, the knife is bending off him. I mean, there's being thick and then there's this. George intercepts the stab and pays for it with his life. There's little time to grieve, however, as Dio dons the mask, forsaking his humanity and becoming a vampire. I watched through part one with a friend. They came to the conclusion that Phantom Blood is a classist diatribe. I have my doubts that's the intention, but as Dio merrily skips through the window, ascending both the sill and his mortal form, I can't help but feel he's happy to have gone from a figurative vampire to a literal one. The police attempt to dispatch him, but are powerless before the might of Dio. Jonathan wields a spear and tells Speedwagon to scarper. So, spear Jonathan. At least now we have some crowd control. This fight does introduce a handful of new elements. You see, vampires can create zombies, and zombies need to have both their green and red health depleted. They're not terribly threatening, so just wail on them. You'll also notice that Dio is in attendance, but his health bar isn't shown on top. He can't be taken out. This stage is trying to teach a lesson about bullying Jonathan never much cared for. You're meant to just ignore Dio. As the saying goes, sticks and stone masks. In a bid to destroy Dio, Jonathan sets the manor ablaze and lures Dio to the roof. 
and Dio is more than happy to show off. Up on the roof, the two face off for the fourth, technically fifth time. There's not much to say about it outside of its unique gimmick. You can push Dio off the side of the roof and into the flames for what I guess is meant to be extra damage. This is nigh impossible to line up due to how knockdown works and how limited your abilities to corral enemies are. You have to maneuver Dio to the very edge and then land a knockdown blow. This just ends up hurting my time more than Dio's. You've got to remember, only one of us here is on the clock. Not to mention, there is an invisible wall here that Dio can pass through freely that you can't. And he has greater range than you. He only becomes more dangerous over there since you can no longer hit him. Most of the time, he'll just flop over the wall, but not far enough to go into the fire, and then just be able to smack you silly from inside. Just ignore the fire. The battle ends with the two falling from the roof to the foyer, with enough time for some light monologuing. Dio is impaled on a statue, and Speedwagon recovers a battered, bruised, and burnt Jonathan. I suppose in this interpretation, it was Jonathan who put Danny in a furnace. And hey, Erina is Jonathan's nurse. She's reunited with her long-legged slab of beef. This has been obvious for a while now, especially if you've read it, but the attempts to recreate certain manga panels with their own models have been my favourite part of this whole experience because they are just so hilariously off. They don't line up proportionally. They don't look good. The lighting is wrong. They're just so lacking. They are hilarious. And outside of his hospital room, Speedwagon talks about how good Erina is for Jonathan, since at this stage, the two are equally in love with the man. Back at the burning husk of the manor, Wang Chan digs through the rubble in hopes of retrieving the mask, thinking he'll make a pretty penny, but he gets more than he bargained for. Later in London, Jack the Ripper did again, and because of this, he's approached by a shadowy figure. Doubling back for a moment, I compiled a PDF of images from the manga panels and some in-game screenshots up to the point Jonathan confronts Dio. I cut out some redundant images, perhaps too many, but I wanted to see how clear the story of Phantom Blood was with just these images. I had assumed, rather falsely, just through these images, Phantom Blood was doing a surprisingly good job telling the story. After all, I can't speak Japanese, so images are all I have to go on. But that isn't true, isn't it? I've also watched the anime, so I have my memories. So, I sent this PDF around to some folk who are totally unfamiliar with Jojo. The most any of them knows is the names, and even then they don't know who these names are. And they sent me their interpretations. It turns out I was very, very wrong. I've included a download of the PDF and the interpretations in the description for your own perusal. It may have been my fault, but a good few came to the conclusion that it was a flashback being talked about. There's a lot of chronological confusion in general, and the poisoning incident with George is completely omitted from every reading. However, Games D did pick up on the core essence of Dio, or in his words, Blondie, that he's an asshole who just likes making life misery for the dandy. I'm going to read one whole interpretation from Lampu because I quite liked it and it does kind of show just how off base I was. His dad dies, but not before telling him some sort of mystery about a dangerous mask. So the dude tries to uncover the mystery and he keeps finding paper notes with hints and clues everywhere. The more he follows them, the more random people he gets into conflicts with, like a bunch of people are trying to impede his progress. But also, the closer he gets, the more agitated the dangerous magic mask gets. I like this interpretation. I like the little addition of cosmic horror, like the mask is orchestrating some grand evil scheme, like it's eventually going to turn the whole world into a vampire or something. It also does paint Dio as the hero and everyone else as random assholes impeding everything. And you know, Maybe that's in a way right. I won't give a complete rundown, but here are some highlights. So I'm thinking the old guy's the blonde guy, but older, and he's recounting the tale of how he got the mask. A huge man in children's clothing suddenly looks in shock at what is happening. The large boy man is holding a hanky that says Jonathan Joestan. The adult bullies beat up the dandy man. Obviously, they did not like his hanky. An old man and his two large adult sons. He's in bed having a think. They are there in their Miami Vice suits. Nice room. It is a nice room. Race with me or the fruit gets it. Holy crap. All women are queens, Dio. If she breathes, she's a thot. I'm honestly so lost right now. Who the fuck are these? Did you cut out some images? Blonde guy kicks the dog. He is clearly a cold, hard man. Joestar is annoyed by Blonde guy's preposterous actions. The dog is left alone. 
to deal with this terrible, unfortunate situation he has been forced into. Then they visit the old man who lives in the mansion and John finds a letter that makes him angrier with Blondie, so he chucks him off a balcony. A few months later, Joe Star is out for blood. No real reason, he just feels like punching someone again. They are saddened by the stories they tell. As we can see, the experiment yielded some interesting results, but as we can see, just looking at chronological but wordless panels from a budget PS2 version does remove some essential grounding a viewer may need to follow the story. But really, we may have got a better plot out of it. While out for a walk, Jonathan and Erina happen upon William A. Zappelli, who stabs Jonathan in the stomach and fixes his wounds. Zappelli has spent a lifetime in training, hoping to hunt down and destroy the mask. Well, he was training to fight vampires who would possess the mask, but there were no vampires at that time. He sort of put the cart before the horse, I feel, and trained in the mountains instead of hunting down and destroying the fucking mask. I mean, the mask itself can be destroyed with a sledgehammer. The sledgehammer takes seconds to pick up. Hamon takes decades. Unless you're Jonathan. Luckily, a whole mess of zombies are nearby, so let's test it out. Two hours into this five-hour title, and the game has given us the other three quarters of the battle system. We now have a chargeable attack. A limit-breaking heat attack. A parry system. Hamon combo finishes with a variety of effects. AoEs, to stuns, to launchers, to flurry punches. And these are dependent on an oxygen system that can be refilled either by holding down a button to breathe, or pressing the breathe button mid-combo to prematurely end it with a pose. That's right, there is a pose button. And the pose has tech. Posing not only fills the air meter faster than breathing, making it redundant, it also grants passive buffs and can be used to exit combos faster if you want to quickly move into a parry, dodge, new combo, or cancel a knockdown attack for easier keeping up of pressure. Plus, zombies are killed by Hamon, meaning they no longer need to be drained of both health bars. Now a hit with Hamon can quickly finish them off. So battles with undead foes become about constantly keeping up and using Hamon. It's a simple, easy to follow, but enjoyable system. Again, I have to talk about how faithful they are. A large stretch of Phantom Blood is spent playing a handicapped version of Phantom Blood so that it can be accurate to Phantom Blood. Before you get too excited, this doesn't mean the game has become good. No, all of this is built on top of the piss poor fundamentals. It still controls bad. You still whiff a ton of shots. You still have a shit time with downed enemies. It's just that now everything is a lot more manageable. It's just that you've been playing with a ball and chain on your leg up to this point. Now they've removed it, and suffice to say, it was being kept around a peg leg. With the zombies dispatched, Erina is left behind as Jonathan, Zapelli, and Speedwagon set off across England to track down Dio and recover the stone mask. Then in a tunnel, Jack the Ripper explodes out of their horse. Oh hey, we can play as Zapelli. He's never that capable again. I've never so consistently had to say, that was the worst fight yet. Phantom Blood tops itself regularly. Jack the Ripper flees into some nearby tunnels, and Zapelli tasks Jonathan with keeping a glass of wine from spilling, as he's sent off to fight a veteran serial killer come vampire. Jack the Ripper's a guerrilla fighter. His plan is to commit hit and runs with his portable Iron Maiden. He's not a hard fight per se, but a tedious one. I've explained how hard it is to hit things, but those things were not traveling at 40 miles per hour. If he just decides not to attack you, which is possible, you are going to lose by time out. Speaking of things that take up too much time, here's what happens when you use your heat move. Oh, by the way, talking about heat moves, I am working on Yakuza 2, don't worry about that. Later on, the party is passing through an old mining village, when a child on a slingshot steals our stuff. That's odd. I thought Hamon was supposed to kill unholy creatures. Dio arrives, bringing with him a legion of zombies, headed up by Bruford and Tarkus. Hey, baby! 
We get two battles in a row, which are purely about beating a wave of zombies, but in one of them, Dio is supervising. These fights are separated by minutes of Dio gas bagging. Battle number 13 is the gimmick fight, taking place entirely underwater. Jonathan's stupidity reaches its peak here. When he gets tossed into a lake, he realizes that he needs to breathe, but he can't. He can't surface because there are enemies poised to strike up there. He then relates a story about wanting to get a toy off of Danny, but couldn't. He learned that if he struggled, Danny would stubbornly resist. However, if he feigned disinterest, Danny would no longer see the significance of the toy. In a life or death situation, the brain goes into panic mode and starts pulling up relevant experiences. You know, it's looking for an exit strategy. But drowning is so alien an experience that the brain just mashes control A. And that experience with Danny is what Jonathan latched onto. Deciding that since this lake is near an old mine, oxygen would be escaping at the bed. So if he wants to breathe, he shouldn't struggle and swim up, but feign disinterest and swim down. And it fucking works. And by god, with this fight, I wish it didn't. You move at a glacial pace. You need to stay near the oxygen geysers or else lose air and health. And Bruford's got a move that if it connects completely, will take half of your health bar. Meanwhile, you've got a combo that could bruise a bream. Not that you'd ever catch one. This combo is so slow and awkwardly paced that I mostly just slid off of Bruford mid-string. And just like the runaway battle earlier, if the much more aquatically gifted Bruford decides to just play keep away, you have already lost. You are not catching him. Luckily, this is a fight that ends instantly if you can get a heat move. <laughs> But that's slow in and of itself. And then we get a rematch on land, and funnily enough, this is the best fight in the game. Bruford is fast, but his moves are big, flashy, and easily read once you see them. And you can actually devise a counter strategy. It demands good blocking, dodging, and good use of Hermon. As he dies, he ruins a perfectly good sword, and tells Jonathan that he has luck and pluck. It's meant as a compliment, but I can't help but feel that it is belittling his victory. I spent the whole game trying to get the score to spell badass. It may be that this game is in Japanese, but here is a new piece of begrudging respect. It's entirely accidental and personal to me. It's not even a factor within the game. Phantom Blood for the PS2 emulates shonen battle manga to an unprecedented degree. Well, no shit is what you're saying. It is literally doing that. But it's not doing it the way that it's trying to. Remember how at the start I realized the winning strategy was to just attack? That stopped working some time ago. Near enough every fight, I lose a few times, work out some new way the game is exploitable, or realize the true usefulness of a technique, and I have to use that new knowledge to overcome the odds. That is a shonen battler. I am discovering new tricks at every turn. This is the fight where I really learned how I had to block. Later on I discovered the parry existed and how to abuse its mechanics. Then I learned how to use posing so I could cancel a combo pushing an enemy away to keep up more pressure. That's just mechanics. I had to stop being so aggressive and actually start approaching enemies differently. Some were hit and runs, some had to be baited. By revealing all of this, it may seem like I've ruined something for you, but I can't claim to have been having the most fun as I discovered all of this. I've played a handful of JoJo games. I don't think what I like about the battles has ever translated into video game form. They are not battles of power or endurance, though that is definitely an element within them. What wins, however, is angling for a decisive blow with powers that are incredibly particular. It's a battle of range, positioning, and traps. The games are about hitting the other guy more. There is an irony in that Phantom Blood here comes second closest by virtue of its shoddy nature. That probably wouldn't have happened if I could read the instructions, but that's on me. Hamon is used to turn leaves into a glider as the group flees Tarkus. They wind up on a pathway leading to a castle dug into sheer cliff. Speedwagon, who has been experiencing an arc of feeling useless to the group, decides to battle through some zombies. And what's really weird here is his fighting style. We don't get to use his razor hat. 
even though that is playable. He is instead wielding a sledgehammer, and for whatever reason it has the same moveset as Spear Jonathan. Spears and sledgehammers are rather different tools, so I think the animators split the difference and made a moveset that's bad for both of them. This is a more traditional beat em up stage. We have to fight our way through several gauntlets of zombies to get to the castle. Once they make it to the entrance, Jonathan goes on in to challenge the giant Tarkus to a battle based on who's heavier. Jonathan is dense, but not in that sense. It goes about as well as it should. And the rest of the party, including the Tagalong Freak Child, named Poco, scramble for a way inside. Zapelli had been told by his master that he would die sacrificing his life for another. And looking at this room, and looking at Jonathan, he realizes that his ticket's up. He realizes this before he enters the room. And he still enters the sodding room. Tarkus is where I learn the power of the parry. Learning it existed turned Tarkus from nightmare to nobody. Regardless, Zapelli gets bisected for his efforts and transfers his Amon to Jonathan. Naturally, this means we replay the fight with an inflated looking Jonathan, this time with some goons to round it out. Sassbed? Damn it, I'm one letter away from an anagram. An odd diversion, but I really dislike the middle of Phantom Blood. Everything following the mansion fire, up until the point we reach Dio's lair, I have a hard time caring for. There are moments I find amusing, but they're for mostly ironic reasons. It's not like the story isn't trying to advance anything. We get Poco facing his fears, Speedwagon feeling useless to the group, Zapelli divulging how much of a twat he is, but these all feel like they're just delaying the real conflict and they don't culminate in much. Dio's henchmen, if you could even really call them that, are very flat and boring. The whole thing feels like wandering the countryside dealing with minor zombie issues, and these people don't really build alongside Jonathan, who doesn't develop either, he just gets buffer. You can extrapolate character development for him out of the whole drowning incident. A friend of mine said that it's sort of a reverse arc however. In most arcs a character would face their flaws and learn how to better accommodate reality. Meanwhile Phantom Blood is about reality learning to better accommodate Jonathan. Hey at least this guy has something interesting to show him. That's his plan to kill Dio, and I'm not worried about spoiling, that it won't work. Say hello to Tom Petty, Dyer, and Straitso. I really hope someone who doesn't watch JoJo is watching this video hearing names like this, not to mention Speedwagon, Zapelli, and, well, Dio. And I wonder at which name the penny will drop. These likely lads are also Hamon users. Tom Petty here trained Zapelli. He was the one who foretold his death. And now they're joining us on our trip to Dio. Three new gimmicks. Poison, small enemies, small flying enemies. Awful, all of them. And the little ones spawn infinitely, so ignore them. Fight through the pain. Poison is just the stricter time limit. Then we make it to Dio's big empty room. I'm guessing it's a study. It has a nice big balcony that any discerning vampire would kill for, and Dio likely has. Notice how nobody makes a good effort to stop Dyer from doing this. <laughs> then we play as Straitso, who's actually the best controlling character in the game. He hits hard, fast, and has lengthy, interesting combos with a lot of juggle potential. It's a shame he's used to just beat up some jobber zombies. He is so much better than Jonathan. So naturally, guess who we play as as we fight Dio twice consecutively? Let's roll the best attack in the game. Now there's an attack to ruin your back. 
I think it's already getting to Jonathan since in round two he abandons the sword, instead settling for setting his hands on fire. And for the 50th time, Dio is vanquished. Sometime later, Jonathan and Erina are about to head off on their honeymoon, and the whole gang is here to see them off. But shock horror, Wang Chan has smuggled a far less buff Dio aboard, and his zombies are tearing through the ship. With the sudden power of incredible high pressure blood rendered here in blue, Dio shoots Jonathan through the neck, rendering him unable to breathe. The final fight is really nothing special. You build up one final heat move, and Jonathan uses Hamon to mind control Wang Chang into gumming up the ship's engine. Yeah, it can do that. So without Wang Chan, Dio is a bit indisposed. Erina runs down upon the grisly scene, and Jonathan urges her to collect a nearby baby and float away to safety. As she escapes, Jonathan tries to rationalize his brotherly bond with Dio as he hugs his disembodied head. Dio, meanwhile, is too busy trying to talk Jonathan into getting him out of this rather bizarre situation, only to realize Jonathan is already dead. And thus ends Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Part 1, Phantom Blood. I personally don't think it's very good. I mean, it starts well, some family melodrama leading to vampirism, but then it descends into countryside bumbling and a bunch of really dull little villains that don't get much in way of personality. Part 2 kicked it up a notch with a far more likeable dynamic protagonist, a bigger globe-trotting adventure set on the cusp of World War II, with more bizarre if a lot more straightforward villains, and Hamon's rules actually have a bit more of a logical thread while retaining its mysticism. I am of the mind that I have no issues telling people to skip part one should they find themselves bored part way through. Wait a minute, I should probably conclude on the game we just covered. Well, it's, it's genuinely quite bad, but I hope you can understand my respect for it. It's all voice acted. They've attempted to recreate many signature scenes. They diluted their own gameplay to match the awkward pace of the story. There are two playable speed wagons, but in the story you only get to experience one that's a clone of Jonathan. A ton of playable characters, but only having a piddly bonus battle mode, along with a survival mode with a handful of selected characters, and a cutscene for Dio mode. There is an obvious adoration of its source material, but they made every bad call they could along the way in showing it. A lot of this was probably lack of talent and funds, but some of what we see in this game had to just be bad calls being made where a clearer head would have steered clear. And that brings us to a close. Thank you all so much for joining me and thanks to those who participated in my dumb little experiment. And a thank you to all my patrons. Those who do pledge get a thank you, get access to scripts and notes, though this video has no notes, and access to a bonus Q&A video where I answer questions, go into any extra details and loose threads, and test out features in the game that they request. My patrons are Roombasan, King 119 Noonan, Sigurd, Tomaskos, Armin Reddy, Wagman, Alt F4 Games, Samson, Corrupted, Zeno, Nick Morrow, Jonathan Guterres, Elowin, The Tried Piper, Brand, Jonathan Hume, Tom Hughes, Jack Saint, Wraith, Pike Gregorian, I Love OP, a JoJo reference, hope you enjoyed this one, Cody Druega, Sturva Kajit, Andreas Huber, Pertwee Odedra, Neoji, Similar Dude, Sentry Down, Above Up, Park Corvian, Sinulia, Dylan Stewart, Lyndon Swift, Urshirak, Kyle Ryan, Cypher, Josh King, Tyler Holland, Meme Queen, Evil Bobarino, R. Deimos, Lightning Rod, Chatter S. Stop, Jan Sayworth, Nick Bush, Alex Armyball, Harrison Tucker, Nicolay Yelson, Quebec, Zach Wave, Wright, Cool Dude, Peter Moravan, Trajan Smith, Battle Rarity, Velrus, Caden the Dingo, and Psycho Soda Pop.